Hey, if you have your Bibles with you, will you turn with me to Romans 14? We're going to continue our series through the book of Romans this morning. If you're using one of those red Bibles underneath your seat, we should be on page 1008 if I counted it right. And then if you're using the YouVersion Bible app, all the Bible verses are on there. All the scripture verses are on there as well. This morning we're continuing our series through the book of Romans. And as you may remember, last week we examined the law of liberty or freedom that exists for the Christian, thanks to the finished work that Christ accomplished on the cross. And today, we're going to be continuing this conversation as we look at the importance that Christ-like love has in the life of the believer. So last week, we looked at the first 12 verses of chapter 14, and today we're going to pick up chapter 14 in verse 13. Verse 13, Paul is speaking, and he says, Therefore, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, Decide never to put a stumbling block or a pitfall in the way of your brother or sister. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Still, to someone who considers a thing to be unclean, to that one, it is unclean. For if your brother or sister is hurt by what you eat, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy by what you eat someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be slandered. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and receives human approval. So then, verse 19 says, let us pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. Do not tear down God's work because of food. Everything is clean, but it is wrong to make someone fall by what he eats. It is a good thing not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and everything that is not from faith is sin. This is the word of the Lord. Will you bow your heads as we pray this morning? Dear Lord, I just thank you so much that we have this opportunity today to sit under the preached word, to hear from you this morning. Lord, I, I pray that you would open our minds and ears to hear your voice today. May we leave here changed, not because of anything I've said, but because of everything you've said, Lord, through your word. Speak to us this morning through your Holy Spirit, and may we leave here changed because of the redeeming work of the power of your gospel. In your holy and precious name, I pray. Amen. All right. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning this morning, Paul is continuing the conversation that was started last week. If you were with us this last week, then some of what we're going to talk about this morning might seem like review, as Paul is wrapping up his thought here in the opening verses of chapter 14 here to the Romans. If you were not with us last week, or you did not get a chance to go back and listen to the sermon, or or maybe you just simply forgot what we talked about last week, that's okay. Don't worry. Because I'm going to give us a quick recap so that we're all on the same page before we unpack these powerful verses this morning. Last week, as we returned to our series through the book of Romans, we saw Paul address issues between the Gentile and the Jewish believers in Rome. In the opening verse of 14, Paul addresses issues that have arose between the weak and the strong believers. These issues had become so severe that they were causing division, disunity, and even disdain within the New Testament church. As you remember, the Jewish believers were wanting to hold fast to some of the traditional customs and practices that they were used to. And the fact that there is freedom found in Christ, many of those customs were no longer necessary. Well, the fact of the matter was that they had the freedom to eat bacon, but they weren't comfortable with their newfound freedoms. They weren't comfortable with that idea. On the flip side of this divisive issue, the Gentile believers were rejoicing so much in their freedoms that it was actually causing bigger problems than it was solving. Their behavior was, in fact, making the Jewish Christians feel uncomfortable. And the Jewish believers did not feel like their Gentile brothers and sisters were respecting their desires or their choices when it came to worshiping God and honoring Him. Remember, in addition to eating certain types of food, there was the issue also about customs like observing the Sabbath and keeping it holy. 
As a result, these two people groups with very diverse backgrounds had started fighting and arguing over what they both believe the life of a Christian should look like and how believers can best reflect that new life that is found in Christ, the life that's lived separate or differently than the life of those who are living for the world around them. All of this conflict, all of these arguments that we read about last week brings us to the pitiful point here in verse 13, where we see Paul attempting to bring peace and resolution to this conflict that has just gotten out of hand. You can see Paul shift gears towards the end as he begins our text today with the word, therefore. Paul says, therefore, meaning in light of everything that's going on, all the issues that I've just addressed, here is what I encourage you to do. In our text this morning, we see Paul explaining how the Christian church in Rome should act and behave, not as a divisive or a disgruntled group of believers, but rather as a unified body of Christ followers. At this point, you might recall the main theme that we saw from our text last week. The main point that Paul made last week was that all believers should welcome and accept their fellow believers. I think we established that point pretty clearly last week. So now, today... Therefore, or in light of the fact that all believers should welcome and accept their fellow believers, Paul is telling the church today that after they've welcomed their fellow believers, they now need to love one another and pursue peace as a unified body of believers. That's the main point that I hope you will see from God's word this morning. That as Christians, we are to love our brothers and sisters in Christ and pursue peace as a unified body of believers. It's the main argument that Paul is making here in the remaining verses of chapter 14. In addition to calling on the church to accept one another and to love one another, he actually, actually lines out four steps or four ways that we as believers can love our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of what our own preferences and personal opinions might be. If you're taking notes, the first thing that Paul says we need to do is to love other believers. We need to, in order to love them, we need to not be a hindrance for others. We love others by, one, not being a stumbling block. We love others by not being a hindrance or a stumbling block for them. We saw that in our first three verses of our text today. Look with me again at the opening verses, verses 13 through 15. Paul says, therefore, or in light of this, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or a pitfall in the way of your brother or sister. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Still, to someone who considers a thing to be unclean, to that one it is unclean. For if your brother or sister is hurt by what you eat, you're no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy by what you eat someone for whom Christ has died. In verse 13, Paul reminds us again not to judge one another. His words echo the same words we've heard from Jesus. Many are familiar with Jesus talking in Matthew 7, where he says, don't judge others so that you won't be judged, for we're going to be judged by the same standard in which we judge others. Many of us are familiar with those famous words. And Paul is repeating that same theme here this morning. Just as we saw last week, not only is Paul saying that we shouldn't judge others, but he's using this word judgment as a reminder not to despise or to look down on one another. Remember, the strong Christians have been looking down on the weaker Christians, and the weaker believers have started despising their stronger brothers and sisters. So, rather than judging or looking down on one another, instead, Paul is instructing his readers to determine not to be a stumbling block or a pitfall for anyone. Now, before we unpack this any further, I need to let you guys know this. Under no circumstance am I going to try to pronounce the Greek words here that Paul is using. <laughs> I am not even going to attempt to try, because I know at the very least I'm going to pronounce them. And I know at the very best I will only make people like Terry or Pastor Brian or Oleg, who know how to speak Greek, laugh at me as I try. <laughs> so I'm not going to say these words in the Greek. But what I will say is this. The Greek words that Paul is using here for what we read as stumbling block or pitfall in our English translation, while they are similar words, they have very different meanings. The Greek word for stumbling block, which I can't pronounce, 
refers to an item carelessly left out that someone in turn unintentionally trips over. It's kind of like when we as husbands leave our shoes out and then our wives come through with a laundry basket and trip over our shoes and laundry goes everywhere. That's unintentional. Those are stumbling blocks. <laughs> now the Greek word for pitfall, on the other hand, is referring to something that was deliberately left out to ensnare another person. In these situations, it's kind of like when I walk into the kitchen at home and I can smell it. My wife's just brought out a fresh batch of chocolate chip cookies. They're out of the oven and they're cooling on the counter. And I'm thinking to myself, I just told her two days ago I was going on keto for realsies this time and now there's chocolate chip cookies on the counter. It's a pitfall. It's a trap. I'm reminded of that weird Star Wars looking guy, Admiral whatever. He says, it's a trap, it's a pitfall. <laughs> Paul is very deliberately stating here that what, whether intentionally or unintentionally, we must determine not to cause our weaker brothers to stumble by exercising our Christian freedom. While the Jewish Christians and the Gentile believers may disagree over what foods are clean and what foods are unclean, in verse, verse 14, Paul clearly states that he recognizes how in Christ, there's neither clean or unclean food. It's evident to him where the Lord stands on this issue. However, as Paul states in verse 15, if we, while exercising our Christian liberties, in turn hurt our brother or sister by what we're eating, we're no longer walking in love. It is more important that we love our brothers and sisters than it is that we are right. As Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians, if we speak with human or angelic tongues, but we do not have love, man, we're just a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. God is love, and without love it is impossible to please him. It doesn't do us a bit of good to have our doctrine right if we're just going to beat others over the head with it. God has called us to love one another as well. Yes, right doctrine is important. Yes, there are going to be times where we have to draw a line in the sand and stand on the truths of God's words and say, this is what the Bible says. There are going to be hills that we need to die on for the sake of the gospel. That being said, oftentimes the hills that we decide to take a stand on are ant hills. They're not mountaintops. <laughs> That's clearly what Paul is seeking to bring to the believers here in Rome. Don't forsake your brothers in Christ in order to stand firm on an ant hill. While the strong in faith are free from customs, such as the observance of days or food regulations, if they express their freedom at the expense of their weaker brothers and sisters, they've forgotten how to love them. If the weak in faith who desire to observe both the Sabbath and certain food regulations were to abandon those restrictions in the name of freedom, it would in turn violate their faith. Both groups of people are seeking to honor the Lord. We saw that last week. It doesn't matter what freedoms we have as Christians. If we're just going to exercise our freedoms out of a desire to stomp on our brothers or sisters who are weaker in their faith than we are, it's our love for one another that sets us apart. You heard Pastor Brian say that this morning. John 13, 35 says, Everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. God's Word reminds us that rather than despising or looking down on others, Rather than flaunting our religious freedoms, we instead need to determine in our hearts to love one another by committing not to be a stumbling block or a pitfall for anyone else. When we do that, when we're able to turn and act that way, we're able to love one another and pursue peace as a unified body of believers. The second way that Paul says we can love others is by living our lives as citizens of God's kingdom. We need to live as citizens of God's kingdom. That's the second thing I want you to see this morning. Look again at verses 16 through 18. Verse 16, Paul says, Therefore, don't let your good be slandered, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God, and he receives human approval. The Christian life is about more than the food we eat or the items we drink. Or it's more about the clothes we wear or the things that we do or the things that we don't do on the Lord's Day. 
The Pharisees lived their lives according to outward appearances. And as we know from Scripture, the Lord is far more concerned with our inward condition than he is with our external appearance. We saw from Scripture in the Old Testament when Israel was searching for a king, God reminded Samuel that man sees what's on the outside, but the Lord sees the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the, uh, his appearance or his stature, because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see only what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. The kingdom of God is about more than the things of this world. That's the very point that Paul is reminding the church of in these two verses. The kingdom of God isn't about eating or drinking. It's about righteousness. It's about peace. It's about joy and love. If those words sound familiar, they should. Many of us have seen those same words in Galatians 5, where Paul is once again addressing the freedom for the Christian. Galatians 5.13, Paul says, For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in this one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. I pray to God we are not biting or devouring each other here at Redeeming Life. That sounds terrible. Paul continues in Galatians 5 by outlining what the works of the flesh look like. Yeah. Then he follows that by what the fruits of the Spirit are. Many of us didn't escape Sunday school with learning about these amazing fruits, right? Galatians 5.22 says the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Remember, put on Christ. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, these. Brothers and sisters, these are the character traits of a kingdom citizen. This is what it looks like when you're focused on God and not on provoking one another or envying, or looking down, or despising your fellow believers. They will know you are my disciples by your love, Jesus says. The Christian journey is about more than our freedoms. It's about our love for one another. I heard a familiar pastor say once, I cannot see the condition of your soul, but I can be a fruit inspector. <laughs> While it is impossible for human eyes to know whether someone has been redeemed by Christ or not, we can all perceive what is happening on the inside based on the fruit that their life is producing. Is your life producing good fruit? Or is your life producing sour fruit? In Romans 14, 17, Paul outlines key characteristics of the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy. These are the primary elements of God's kingdom. Righteousness, peace, and joy are essential characteristics of the life that has been transformed by the salvific work of Christ on the cross. The foods that we eat and drink only serve our human needs. However, the gospel is about so much more than that. The gospel is about serving Christ rather than ourselves. This is the point that Paul is seeking to drive home to the New Testament believers in Rome. Christianity is about more than the temporal. It's about the eternal it's about more than satisfying the needs of the flesh. It's about living for Christ and serving him. This life is about more than the temporal. There are eternal consequences for the choices that we make here on earth. The Bible is clear. The wages of sin is death. And the bad news is we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Thankfully, while we were still enemies of the king, God sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins so that we would not have to perish but might have eternal life. And I challenge you to find a more rewarding, more encouraging news than that in the world today. If we're going to live like kingdom citizens, we need to be more concerned with the kingdom of God than the trivial matters concerning the temporal world around us. There is kingdom business to attend to, and it is urgent. Yeah. 
That being said, we need to remember, church, that when we put our needs above others, when we put their needs above our own needs, or their desires above our own desires, we'll be more likely to love one another and pursue peace as a unified body of believers. The third way that Paul shows us that we can love each other is by pursuing peace and building up one another. Pursue peace and build up one another. This is what Paul mentions here in Romans 14, 19 through 20. Look back at those two verses with me. Paul says, so then, let us pursue peace. Pursue what promotes peace and what builds up one another. Do not tear down God's work because of food. Everything is clean, but it is wrong to make someone fall by what he eats. Now, as powerful as pizza is, <laughs> the kingdom of God cannot be destroyed by a pizza parlor. That's not what Paul is saying here. What he is saying is that rather than seeking our own needs and our desires for our fleshly concerns, we must put the needs of our brothers and sisters above ourselves and pursue things that produce peace and unity. Rather than being divided over whether or not pizza belongs on pizza, which it does, we should praise God that there is pizza. Before we get caught up in the joys of our spiritual freedoms, the questions that we have to ask ourselves is this. Is what I am doing building up my brothers and sisters in Christ? Especially those who might be younger or less experienced in their faith than I am. This point should be especially easy for parents of multiple children to understand. If you've had multiple children, then you've probably had moments where you're leaving the house, everyone's loading up in the prestigious minivan, and chances are some kids are taking longer to get ready and to get into the car than others are. I remember these experiences from my own childhood. Mostly, I remember my parents' minivan. It was one of those classics from the 90s, you know, with the fake wood paneling that after about 30 years is like peeling and chipping away. The black paint that started oxidizing and it's weird and it's kind of fading. These are the cars that you could never get rid of. They're just, you own them forever, right? Trust me, I tried to get rid of it. Um, nevertheless, if you've had multiple kids, then leaving the house usually plays out like this. There's always that one kid who's in the car. He's buckled in, he's ready to go. He has all the things because he takes everything with him everywhere. But he's buckled up, ready to go. Fun fact, that kid usually grows up to be a pastor who still carries everything with him everywhere in his backpack. <laughs> Nonetheless, there's then a second kid who's still fighting to get their shoes on right inside the doorway of the house. They're fighting and wrestling with their shoes as if they're battling a countdown clock on a game show. They just can't quite get it all put together and get it on in time. Lastly, if you have three or more children, there's at least one baby who's strapped into their infant car seat in the living room, praying to God that in all the commotion, all the chaos, their parents don't forget them and leave them sitting there by the fireplace. <laughs> Is this not basically what happened in the Home Alone movie? Everyone's frantically leaving, they're rushing to get out of the house, and Kevin gets what? Kevin gets forgotten. He gets left behind. He gets abandoned. That's in the body of Christ. Not only is it vital that we don't forget anybody and that we don't leave anyone behind, it's also important to remember that we can only move forward as quickly as the slowest members of our faith family. If half the church is stuck in the doorway trying to figure out how to put their shoes on, we can't just abandon them. We're all in this together. We've all heard the saying before that the Christian life is not a life that's lived on a cruise ship. It's a life that's lived on a battleship. And our job, brothers and sisters, is not only to ensure that everyone is manning their post, but that they understand how to operate their battle stations as well. We can't do that if we're too busy tearing one another apart. Rather than let our differences divide us, we must pursue peace and build up one another. Verse 21. Paul says, it is a good thing not to eat meat or to drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. This is such an incredible verse with a powerful sentiment. It is good not to do anything that causes our brothers or sisters to stumble. This verse is even more amazing when you know what the root word good is here. 
according to my study this week, the word that Paul uses here for good can also be translated as beautiful. It is a beautiful thing not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. It's beautiful not to eat or drink anything or do anything that would cause our fellow Christians to stumble and fall. This is the argument that Paul is making to the church here in Rome. It's more beautiful to help one another than it is to despise each other. One of the commentators I studied this week wrote this on that passage of Scripture. He said, it is beautiful because arrogance is gone. It is beautiful because it is unselfish. It is beautiful because it means one has a finely tuned sense of spiritual proportion, recognizing secondary issues for what they are. It is especially beautiful because it puts others first. Loving our brothers and sisters is a beautiful act of worship unto the Lord. As Christians, we are to love one another and pursue peace as a unified body of believers. Which brings us to the fourth point I want us to see from Paul's letter to the Romans this morning. Everything we do must be done with a clear conscience. All of this, everything that we've discussed, must be done with a clear conscience. Do everything with a clear conscience, Paul says. Look again at Romans 22 through 23, those last two verses. Whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats, because he is eating not from faith, and everything that is not from faith is sin. In these last two verses, Paul gives advice to both the strong and the weak believer. Verse 22 is written for the strong believer. Paul is telling the strong believer here that whatever their beliefs are concerning eating and drinking, they need to keep between themselves and God. Not only that, but he's also reminding them that in exercising their liberty, it's important not to condemn themselves by harming someone else. The believer is blessed when he exercises these freedoms without doubt. He is blessed if no one else struggles or is condemned by his behavior. Verse 23, on the other hand, is his advice to the weak believer. In that last verse, Paul is reminding the weak believer that if there is any doubt in their mind, that what they are eating or drinking is acceptable to God, then they should not consider doing it. As I mentioned last week, if you have any doubts, if there is any part of you that is feeling convicted about your actions, if you hear a still small voice in your head saying, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing this. Then don't do it. Because chances are pretty good, the voice you are hearing is the Holy Spirit. I promise you, it is not Jiminy Cricket chirping in your ear. If you've seen the old Pinocchio cartoons, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Jiminy Cricket is this little cricket who sits on Pinocchio's shoulder, giving him advice regarding the things that he should, or more importantly, should not do. Pinocchio needs Jiminy because he himself is a little wooden figurine who's trying to become a real boy, all of which is hinging on his good works that he accomplishes during a probationary trial period. In order to help guide Pinocchio along the way, an angel has enlisted Jiminy Cricket with the not-so-small task of helping Pinocchio recognizes the differences between good and evil. Oh, how much simpler it would have been for Pinocchio if he had just read his Bible. <laughs> While the story of Pinocchio makes for a great cartoon filled with fun family entertainment, we know that the real world, life does not work that way. My wife would be the first to tell you I can be pretty hard-headed at times. I'm sure there are others of us who can be hard-headed as well. However, I do not believe that any of us are made of actual wood. And while we all may have the same, if not a greater sin nature inside of us than Pinocchio had, it is in fact the Holy Spirit who guides us and directs our path, not a cricket. I know this to be a fact for two very important reasons. That's the Holy Spirit, not a cricket. One, God's Word tells us so. In John 16, Jesus is preparing to go to the cross, and as he does, he tells the disciples that after he's ascended into heaven, he's going to send the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. So we know it's the Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us because God's word tells us that. And the second reason I know 
is because I've had a cricket on my shoulder before, and he didn't say anything to me. <laughs> Last week, when church was getting out, one of our young saints, who shall remain nameless, grabbed and caught a little cricket or a grasshopper out here and stuck it on my shoulder. And while we didn't say anything, we both kind of looked at each other and had the same thought. Who is this guy, and why does he look so weird? I don't know if it was a cricket, and I don't know if it was a grasshopper, and I'm not about to disclose to you how much time I spent this week trying to figure out what the differences are between those two creatures. Because it's embarrassing. So whether it was Jiminy the cricket or Steve the grasshopper, I'm here to testify to you this morning that no insect on this planet can take the place of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. That being said, do not let your conscience be your only guide. Conscience is not an infallible guide. However, our conscience is a helpful tool when it comes to things like peer pressure. If there's ever a doubt in your mind whether you should go here or there or eat this or drink that, and you're fighting back this uneasy feeling inside, there's a good chance that that feeling inside of you is coming from the Holy Spirit warning you, saying, hey, don't do that. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to tackling the difficult decisions that we're faced with in life, if we would simply choose to seek the Lord's direction through his word, through time spent in prayer and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, no decision would be too overwhelming or confusing for us to make. Whatever choices we make, whatever we do along the path of life, as we seek to honor God through our actions, we must ensure that everything we do is done with a clear conscience. Based on our text in Romans this morning, it's clearly evident from what we read in God's word that as Christians, we're to love one another, to pursue peace as a unified body of believers. As Christians, we need to live our lives on a high-speed pursuit of peace and unity among our brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we do, we can love one another by not being a stumbling block, by living as a kingdom citizen, actively seeking to benefit others and doing all that we can with a clear conscience. In closing, I'd like to end with these verses from the book of Philippians. Philippians 2, 1 through 4 says, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Unity and diversity. As I mentioned last week, unity and diversity will most likely always exist within the Christian church. After all, diversity is one of the things that makes being a part of a faith family so incredible. But while the diversity among our fellow believers can be great, it's our unity that is truly magical. It is our unity that we share that makes the rest of the world stop and ask, what's different about them? Brothers and sisters, today and every day, let us be a people who pursue peace and share unity before all else. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you for the diversity of your church. Lord, we are many parts, but we are one body. And I thank you for the opportunity that we have to fellowship together, to encourage one another, to lift each other up. Lord, as we leave here today, I pray that we would be an example of what Paul was challenging the church in Rome to do. May we be a people who seek to live as a unified body of believers, a people who are seeking after peace and unity with our brothers and sisters, regardless of our opinions, regardless of our differences, and regardless how we feel about things. May we seek you first and your kingdom first above all else as we seek to honor you and worship you. It's in your precious name, Lord, I pray. Amen.